Good morning. Congratulations to the class of 2017. New Jersey native, Cal Penn. New York Magazine has dubbed him the most famous Indian actor in the world. But he's so much more than an actor. He's an advocate. He's an innovator. He's a teacher. He's a humanitarian. Enjoying immense success in Hollywood, Cal put his acting career on hold to answer the call from the greatest house in America, the White House. It was there that he put his full focus into advancing the public good. As the Associate Director of Public Engagement at the White House in the Obama administration, Cal focused on work related to don't ask, don't tell. And here's an important one increasing financial aid for college students, and even more important than that, bringing back our Americans from Iraq. He also served as a liaison with Asian American and Pacific Islander communities, helping engage them in a variety of social initiatives, and was appointed to President Obama's Committee on the Arts and Humanities. As an actor, Cal didn't miss a beat when he returned to television and film. He currently co-stars alongside Kiefer Sutherland in ABC's new consp conspiracy thriller drama, Designated Survivor. He also hosts and produces The Big Picture with Cal Penn, a National Geographic TV series that uses data and mapping to make powerful connections and visualize our world in amazing new ways. The program exemplifies his commitment to making the world a better place. Each episode uncovers surprising facts on how our world works, how we got here, and where we're headed. On the big screen, Cal has starred in various independent films and blockbusters. Who can forget the two Harold and Kumar movies? <laughs> Superman Returns and Bhopal, A Prayer for Rain. Please direct your attention to the video screens. He's an actor, college instructor, former White House Associate Director of Public Engagement. <laughs> he now stars in a new series, Designated Survivor. Please welcome Cal Penn. There are no shortage of actors out there who have a passion for politics. But for Cal Penn, being politically active goes far beyond raising funds and raising awareness. He actually did the unthinkable in Hollywood terms. He left a hit show like House. What the hell is that? What is that? Your toe just fell off. And took a two-year sabbatical from fame and fortune. You know what he did? He became a junior staffer in the White House. You took a break oh, that's right, from yes. Hollywood and you went to work for the White House. That's right, Cal worked for the Prez as his point person on outreach to youngsters. He even worked to help repeal the Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy. Now, you might be thinking, are we talking about the same Cal Penn, the one who was Kumar in the Harold and Kumar movies? Yes, we certainly are. Just remember that I'm trusting you on this, and I'll see you there. Dude, who was that? It sounded intense. The president. Sweet. 
actor and former member of the Obama White House, Cal Penn, raised quite a bit of money to help Syrian refugees. Little did he know that by posting a negative comment he received telling him that he, quote, doesn't belong in America and linking it to a donation page, he would be able to raise more than $800,000 for Syrian refugees. This is not over. We're gonna keep fighting. I'm gonna keep fighting. I need young people to keep fighting. That's why we're here. Ladies and gentlemen, class of 2017, please join me in welcoming one of New Jersey's treasures, our 2017 commencement speaker, Cal Penn. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. How's it going? Thank you, Tom. I appreciate that. Maybe after this. <laughs> uh, how's it going, Kane? Thank you for having me. Thanks to Tom for the nice introduction. Thank you to Dr. Farahi for, uh, for hosting me. Uh, I'm excited to be here in the presence of so many graduates, friends, well-wishers, faculty. Congratulations. I know that uh, traditionally the commencement speaker is supposed to give you lots of advice, tell you things that are inspirational before you go off into the real world. But since most of you know me for either playing Robin's boyfriend on How I Met Your Mother, uh, or for playing a stoner in the Harold and Kumar movies, I'm, I'm glad that the bar is set low. Much less pressure. Your parents, however, probably know me from House and Designated Survivor, and they think that I'm way more responsible than I am. And that video made me seem wildly responsible, which is good if I show it to my parents, make them feel better. So anyway, there, there's a lot less pressure on me, uh, and also because this is not just a random school that I'm speaking at in a random place that I know nothing about. I'm from New Jersey, I'm glad you brought that up. I, uh, I did go to college and grad school on the West Coast, but if there's one thing that sticks with you if you ever leave New Jersey, it's that you will naturally gravitate towards other people from New Jersey. Whenever I tell my college friends that I'm giving a graduation speech, and I haven't really done that many, so whenever I tell them, they laugh at me, which is what good college buddies should do. This time it was coupled with jokes like, oh, you're doing it in your home state of New Jersey? Will everyone be as uptight as you? We are not uptight, we are motivated. Is the whole state as rude and scary as you are? We are not rude and scary. We are straightforward, and I will kick you in the throat if you don't take that back. <laughs> so being from New Jersey is like an ethnicity. Whenever you leave New Jersey, whether you travel or go for a job interview or visit somewhere else or move, people from New Jersey can spot each other anywhere. And by the way, when I say whenever you leave New Jersey, I am not referring to a night in the city when you miss the last train back and take a nap in Penn Station while you wait for the 5.40 a.m. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about meeting people across the planet who, upon finding out that you're also from New Jersey, extend courtesies that are usually just reserved for secret societies. Things like food recommendations, job leads, finding out you actually had the same teacher in middle school. All of these things will happen, and it's glorious. Do not underestimate the power of being from New Jersey. I guess that's my first lesson, but you didn't spend four years and lots of money to hear a stoner actor give you sage graduation advice about the greatest state in the country. The point of telling you about my college friends making fun of me is that it always feels a little strange to be asked to deliver a commencement address. One, because I know how hungover you guys are. And two, because in order to graduate college, you have to rigorously follow a ton of rules. And most people that I've met and worked with since college have broken rules, and that's what continued, uh, what allowed them to continue to learn and approach the world with a sense of wonder. It's also what's largely allowed themselves to not succumb to cynicism. So 
I'd actually like you to consider this morning after you grab your diplomas and hopefully celebrate with your loved ones to not let yourselves become cynical. As this flattering video mentioned, I had the honor of working for the previous president in some capacity for most of the last eight years. And I remember on his 117th day in office when President Obama delivered a commencement address at Notre Dame. And as leader of the free world, he offered up this uplifting advice to graduates. He said, look at the way I've been treated lately, especially by the media. No politician in history has been treated worse or most uh, more unfairly. Wait a second, sorry. Uh, sorry, that was... Uh, I'm sorry, that, apparently that was a line from President Trump's commencement address on his 117th day in office. I'm sorry, uh, I got the right one. On, I'm sorry, let me do it again. On, on his 117th day in office, President Obama delivered a commencement address at Notre Dame and as leader of the free world, offered this uplifting advice to graduates. He said, in this world of competing claims about what is right and what is true, have confidence in the values with which you have been raised and educated. Your generation must decide how to save God's creation from a changing climate that threatens to destroy it. Your generation must seek peace at a time when there are those who will stop at nothing to do us harm, and when weapons in the hands of a few can destroy the many. In short, we must find a way to live together as one human family. Remarks like that set the tone for those of us who served President Obama, and I was reminded of that yesterday, not just by the contrast in graduation speeches by consecutive presidents, but because of the choice these contrasts offer all of us, now more than ever. As New Jerseyans, we live in a very well-educated state that ranks very high in terms of things like healthcare, diversity, the job market, and graduation rates but you inevitably will have friends who live in states that don't share our values and priorities. We disagree with them. Respectful disagreement can be a very good thing. When you turn on the TV these days and see conversations about shared values taking a back seat to more incendiary conversations where people yell and scream at each other, it makes fantastic television, but the immediate response is to tune out and get cynical. That's exactly why this stuff is designed that way. It's why someone would criticize the media in a graduation speech. But don't get cynical. Don't stop caring because you're paying attention to the wrong format. If you want news, subscribe to the failing New York Times and sign up for push notifications. Listen to free things like Pod Save America and Pod Save the World. There are lots of less cynical options than television or half of Twitter. And the reason I'm saying not to get cynical after you graduate is because what President Obama alluded to eight years ago yesterday is still true, and I had the chance to experience it. Your generation is vastly different than the one above it, which I guess is mine. Most young Americans, like you, accept certain things as basic facts. Climate change is real. Science is real. There is a value in education. We should be able to marry the people we love. We may disagree on how to fund certain things, but we tend to not disagree on the fundamentals of what is and is not real, what is and is not fake. As White House staffers, one of our jobs was to execute promises made by the president. And one of the tasks that I had as President Obama's liaison to young Americans was to work on issues like climate change by bringing people together, as he mentioned in his graduation speech eight years ago. At a conference we hosted at the White House for young people on topics like energy and climate, I remember that about a third of the folks we invited were young progressives, people who were activists, people on the left who were passionate advocates for the environment. Another third of the folks we invited to this summit were young conservatives many of whom were evangelicals. Now for them, their religious beliefs meant that they view themselves as stewards of God's planet, and that's why they wanted to come and contribute to that conversation. 
and roughly the remaining third of young people or so who were invited weren't necessarily progressives or conservatives, but were young business owners and innovators. They were just creating cool gadgets, like a device that would charge your smartphone using a human being's kinetic energy. That's why they showed up. Now, the reason I tell you this relatively boring story of who was in the room for a conversation about climate change is that it's likely that an older generation wouldn't have that much in common about a single issue if they were from such different walks of life. And I remember experiencing this. The evangelicals did not agree with us on other issues that the White House was tackling. The progressives in the room thought that at the time, President Obama was too conservative. And the young business owners who showed up just wanted to eventually make a million dollars. But they all sat together for a day trying to come up with a joint strategy to build support for comprehensive climate change action. Now, some of that action succeeded. Some of it fell short. Some of it is getting rolled back now. But it's an example of something not controversial or sexy enough to end up trending on social media or as a top story of CNN. And chances are you never heard about this summit. It's an important lesson in what's possible if we reject cynicism and come together. For better or for worse, when you leave this place, you're going to enter a world that moves much more slowly than you'd like it to. Many of you will struggle immensely to find a job or pay off loans. Those of you with jobs might be working 90 hours a week in a really fast-paced environment. I hope you'll fall in love. Many of you will deal with heartbreak. You'll find yourselves having to do and experience things that are much more difficult than you ever could have imagined. You may lose friends, and you might find yourself missing things like weddings and birthdays because you're working weekends or because you're unemployed and can't get the cash together to visit someone. Don't get cynical. Treat yourselves and other people kindly. They're likely experiencing much of the same things in life that you are, no matter how differently they may seem at first glance. And maintain your sense of humor. I was once sitting at my desk at the White House reading a government document on security in Asia. And for those of you who have had any government experience, everything in government is acronyms. So they'll mention the name of an organization like the American Association of retired persons, and then for the rest of the document, it'll just say AARP. So this one document I was reading came across my desk, and it was talking about an organization, the name of which I will change, but it retains the same initials. So let's call it the Manchester International Laundering Fund. So this document that, uh, that I was reading first mentioned the Manchester International Laundering Fund, and then proceeded to only refer to it by its acronym, MILF. So there I was in a serious government job, reading about how MILF can be very dangerous. <laughs> MILF can take advantage of you in an unsuspecting way. I thought it was hilarious. I had the best day. You can do serious work without losing your sense of humor. Try to remember that when the world jars you, when you have rough days at work and you miss your friends and family, that not everyone is trying to wish you ill. It's important to change their minds and change the system if you can, and to ignore haters without letting them get under your skin. It makes sense to speak to people kindly and respectfully, even if you're not getting the same in return. And take every job you have seriously. On my second day at work at the White House, I was tasked with helping put together an executive order that President Obama wanted to sign that would essentially have streamlined federal resources for underserved communities in areas like language access, health services, a lot of different things that the federal government, until that point, had wasted money on instead of spending it more wisely. So my job on my second day was to convene a conference call between something like 18 different federal agencies, and I knew that on the call they were going to discuss whether one of these 18 agencies should be part of the president's executive order or whether President Obama would find it wasteful. So I joined the call at 10 a.m. on day two at the White House, and I was excited after the end of this call to go back and report the results to my boss. So I'm on the phone. These different 18 agencies are debating whether one in particular should be part of the president's executive order. And 10 turns into 10.30, I'm still taking notes, and around 10.50, the call starts to wrap up. And somebody says, great. So that was a great call. What's the decision? 
And there's a lot of silence on the call, and I'm still taking notes, ready to write down the decision. And someone else on the call goes, well, who's on from the White House? And I stop taking notes, and I kind of look up, and I go, this is Cal. And I go, yeah, so what's the decision, Cal? And for a second, I thought to myself, surely there's an adult somewhere on the phone <laughs> who's going to make this decision, right? And it dawned on me that I was the adult in the room. So without missing a beat, I said, I think the president would find it wasteful to have this particular agency included in the executive order, and we don't need it. Everybody else said, thank you very much. We'll join the next call a week from today to talk about the next item on the agenda for this executive order. I hung up the phone, and I ran to my boss's office. I mean, I ran like down the stairs, through the West Wing, up to the third floor, and I walked into her office, and I said, hey, I just got off that conference call. I said that the, 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 the agency can't be part of the president's executive order. And she was at her desk typing. She goes, great, that's why we hired you. <laughs> and then she had this smirk on her face. And I was like, yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, I just figured I'd like run over and tell you like what happened. She's like, yeah, you know, next time you can just email me. You don't have to run all the way over here. It was my first experience with being trusted with something that I was a little bit insecure about. But the people who hired me knew that I had the capacity to make a decision on. And I'm going to jump a little bit ahead. When it came time for the president to sign this executive order, one of the things that my office was in charge with was putting together the signing ceremony. So the president wanted to invite people from the communities that would be affected by this particular executive order on a Monday morning to, to come to the East Wing and watch him sign it. I decided that I was going to make my intern come in over the weekend to help plan and go through, really dot the I's and cross the T's on what this signing ceremony would look like. You know, where people are going to sit, where the president's going to walk in, how we're going to brief him. And the rule at the White House was you shouldn't really go into the East Wing, which is the president's residence, on the weekend. But I told my intern that's what we were going to do. So he came in on a Sunday, and I made him go to the East Wing with me. And we walked through. And uh, we were on our way back down the White House colonnade, which is the, this beautiful outdoor hallway with columns that you might have seen in photos. And the reason that I did this was I told my intern, he said, we're really not supposed to do this. And I said, I understand. But if I screw up this event, the CNN headline is going to say something like, Kumar screws up Obama event. I was like, can we just not do that? Like, I'm going to take a risk and go into this guy's house and walk through the event just you and I, so that we know what we're doing on Monday morning. So we get to the colonnade to go back to the West Wing, and all the way at the end is a guy who sort of looks like the president. And I was on my Blackberry looking down at the ground, and my intern, who I'm, I've told this story a few times, and apparently I make him sound like a child. He was a, a, like a grown-ass man. My intern is like 26 years old. His name is James. He like tugs on my suit jacket. And he goes, um, I think that's Barack Obama. So I look up and I go, oh, yeah, there, that's the president. And James says, uh, well, what do we do? I'm like, well, James, what do you, you want to do, man? You got three choices, right? You can go back into his house. We can continue down the hallway to my office. Or uh, you can jump over those bushes there. And I assume they're like guys with machine guns and dogs and things like that that are going to take you out. So why don't we just keep walking? And James says, oh, OK, I'll, I'll do what you do. I said, all right, sounds good. So we meet the president in the White House colonnade, and it's just the three of us. And he says, what are you working on? And to James, apparently, that sounded like, what were you doing in my house? <laughs> so he was very nervous. He didn't say anything. And I said, uh, well, sir, I don't know if you remember, but uh, tomorrow morning you're signing an executive order uh, to help particular communities that have been underserved in the past. Gave him a little spiel, 30 seconds, and he said, yeah, you know, I'm glad we're finally doing that. I know it took a while to get up and running, but I'm glad we're doing it. It's the right thing to do. And, uh, and I remember looking at him and thinking, well, this is pretty interesting. You know, there's no press around. There's no media. There are no donors. There's nobody who could ever repeat that story and say, the president said it was the right thing to do because it's going to help him get reelected. This was really a moment in which there was a guy who's the leader of the free world who was excited that his junior staffers were working on something because he really believes it's the right thing to do for the American people. So we went back to my office. We said bye to him, said, I'll see you tomorrow. Go back to my office, and the first thing James says is, can I call my mom? I said, yes, James, you can call your mom and say you met the president. And then James is like, can I go on Facebook? I'm like, no, James. 
you can't post about that. But the reason that I thought about that a lot afterwards was that, you know, the president did sign that executive order the following day. And a few months later, if you fast forward, the BP oil spill happened in the Gulf. And fishermen in the Gulf were deeply affected, fishing communities in particular, because that was their livelihood. BP had polluted the water so badly that a lot of these communities couldn't fish, and they weren't sure how they were going to pay the bills. What a lot of folks also didn't realize was that there were a large number of fishermen in the Gulf who were of Vietnamese descent, refugees, immigrants, a lot of people who spoke English but not as their first language. So when BP was dealing with them and lining up things like settlements, they had no idea what they were being asked to sign. One of the provisions in the executive order that the president had signed months before that included things for translation services so that we could send people down to the Gulf and help these American fishing communities understand what papers they were being asked to sign. Now, we didn't send people down there to tell them whether they should or shouldn't sign something. We just offered them the opportunity to understand so their families could make that decision. And if the president hadn't created this initiative through executive order, we wouldn't have been able to help these people. And the notion that he did it because it was the right thing to do is something that has stuck with me. The states affected by the BP oil spill are deeply red. Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, they did not vote for President Obama, but that didn't matter because it was time to come together and focus on the shared values that we had as Americans. Imagine how cynically people might approach that today, an industrial or environmental disaster in a place that maybe didn't vote for the folks in power. It can make you cynical just thinking about what that media coverage might be like. The point of telling you that is that if you're lucky, now that you're graduating, perhaps for the first time, you're going to be around people who you aren't related to and who you don't go to school with who think differently than you do. It's okay to be a little insecure, to try very, very hard, and to want to do something just because you know it's the right thing to do and it might help somebody at some point. Enjoy that journey. Enjoy that struggle of all of the things that are to come and enjoy all of the wonderful things that you're about to do, whether you get credit for it or not. Reject cynicism. Talk to and work with people who you might disagree with on a regular basis. Laugh at a MILF joke. Good luck explaining what MILF means to your parents this afternoon. Congratulations, graduates. Thank you.